Hello, fellow outlaws. I am Hal Sea Raider, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the third chapter of Bandit's Ballads. In chapter one, you've witnessed my alternate personality, Balon Blacktide, arrive to a new continent, experience some Calradian hospitality, and after many trials and tribulations, eventually find himself a weapon and a loyal friend. Then in chapter 2, he put his limited assets to good use and managed to expand his meager arsenal, assembled a small gang of 11 thieves and amassed a little over a thousand dinars. In addition to that, he also invested a small fortune into a few horses whose purpose is improving the gang's mobility, which allows us to run away from enemy parties that are too dangerous to fight. After a couple of slow-paced episodes, our protagonist is now in a place where most adventurers begin their journeys, a situation that many take for granted. Getting to this point was not easy after hitting rock bottom, but now that we're here, Balon and his cronies are in a position where they can scale their operations, make some real money, and eventually form a raiding party that can actually take whatever they want, whenever they want, and from whoever they want. Hey, why are you spoiling the story? Spoiling? It's called planning. Just because I make a plan doesn't mean I'll see it through without a hitch. Besides, I can't just drift around aimlessly like a leaf in the wind. I have to set myself some goals to give me a sense of direction in this chaotic world. I didn't leave my homeland behind just for the sake of being in Calradia. I came here for a very specific reason. So I can live my life in accordance to Ironborn tradition. A tradition that my people were forced to abandon in the name of... Progress. So now that you know my objectives, let us make progress towards achieving them. In pursuit of my goals, however, I have to adhere to the philosophy of I'll take what I can get, and unfortunately, right now I can only get into a fight with looters. Because that's literally all we've done in Chapter 2. I'll spare you the finer details of all the upcoming looter fights unless something really interesting were to happen. For now, know that assaulting looters is about more than just unburdening them of their earthly belongings. Of course, that is the primary goal, but because these fights are super easy, I shall also use these poor sods as my personal training dummies because when they inevitably come to the conclusion that they have no chance to win, they'll start running for their lives, at which point I can drop my weapons to make myself lighter on my feet, ride out in front of them, dismount and proceed to slice and dice in order to get some sweet 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 clean speed, cause life is too short to be slow. Damn advertisements. I wanted to say, get some sweet athletics skill points, but if you think about it, the ad wasn't wrong, because the more you improve your athletic condition, the speedier you are on the battlefield. At the end of my first fight, I rescued a Sturgeon peasant who was abducted by the thieves and as a gesture of gratitude, he offered to join my group of traveling pilgrims. I hope he'll also become a veteran archer sometime in the future, just like the first Sturgeon peasant I rescued. After that brief display of camaraderie, one of my prisoners asked if I'll take him on, and now there were 13 of us. But I reckon we'll recruit a lot more people in the future, and I expect many of them to lose their lives, so let's not waste too much time talking about each and every new person I hire. Another thing I kept doing every time I fought a group of enemies was allowing at least one of them to escape, so that I may squeeze him for more loot. That's what I've done with the last survivor of my first fight. I let him run away, and when I caught up to him, told him to surrender or die. He tried to bargain with me, offering his service in exchange for letting him live, but if I were to accept his offer, I would have lost out on the money I expected to get by just killing him. You see, on my first attack, I earned a hundred and nice dinars, and on the double tap, I would have gotten half of that amount, about 85. And to put it simply, a looter's life is not worth 85 gold coins. So I refused his offer and sent my men to kill him, earning a little over 250 dinars from the whole ordeal. But again, we've already been through this in chapter 2, so how about we talk about something a little more interesting? But uh, wait, I received a telepathic message from one of you, asking me, Hal, you began the video with a thousand dinars. Why do you only have 700? Well, little Timmy, to answer your question, 
I now have less money because I bought a few more Batanian horses before I even left the village of Svenrin. As a matter of fact, I purchased another three in order to maximize our traveling speed. I could have bought four, but I had a couple of reasons for not doing so. Reason number one, I only had 10 soldiers, so I didn't need more than 10 horses for them. And number two, because the daily wage of my gang is 36 dinars, I wanted to keep my balance above 360 just in case we can't find anyone to steal from in the following 10 days. Satisfied with the answer? Can we move on to something more interesting please? After raiding those looters, I was in what is known as a dangerous situation because a Sturgeon nobleman was roaming these lands and uh, my group was disorganized from the recent fighting. If Uric were to take notice, he could catch me before my party recovered its mobility. As you can see, his 4.4 movement speed is higher than my 3.3. So the only thing I could do was sprint in the opposite direction and hope for the best. The Lord did take notice and started chasing us, but my crew got its shit together and we got out of there with no issues. When the whole world's your enemy, you have to be acutely aware of your surroundings at all times before engaging in a fight. As we were making our escape, I spotted a group of five sea raiders and because they're bound to have some decent gear, I gave chase to them. But they weren't stupid. To disincentivize me from attacking them, they ran towards the Sturgeon army, putting me in a difficult position because if I were to assault them, we would have gotten disorganized and eventually caught by the local authorities. What kind of man talks to the DEA? No man at all. But patience is one of my strongest virtues, so I simply waited for Uric to sod off and when the area was clear, I told the raiders to surrender themselves to me. But alpha males refused to bend to the Sigma's will, due to their macho pride, even though it's the healthier alternative, so they gave me no choice but to kill them all. However, don't think for a second that this was an easy fight. The numbers say that my 13 should wipe the floor with their 5, but my men are mostly looters who lack the appropriate defensive measures against javelins. And if even one of them dies in battle, that can create a domino effect that can send the others running for their lives, which you've seen how it ends, with fatal wounds on their backs. In order to avoid all that trouble, I decided to make myself the primary target of these raiders and make them aim their javelins at me and also hopefully miss all of their shots. I have a quick horse, only extreme misfortune would get me to taste the same medicine I've doled out to dozens of people. My plan seemed to work rather well because two of these guys ended up pursuing me, leaving only three for my men to deal with. The one without a shield was the first to perish after I gave him a couple of doses of my FDA approved vaccine. As for the shielded raider, I waited for him to drop his guard and then added a bit more iron to his diet. But I was getting worried for the safety of my men, so I rode to the front line and launched my final javelin towards the raider chief, who was entirely capable of killing several of our people. But I missed and accidentally got one of my looters killed. Not much I can say except, whoops, butterfingers. I don't know how to feel about the fact that sometimes it's better to do nothing than attempt to help. Oh well, at least the fight was won and that's all that mattered, so at the end of it, I collected about a hundred dinars, captured the only raider who survived, and looted a scarf that would protect my neck from the freezing temperatures that I actually endured with no problem, even when I was completely naked. With that done, I went into the nearest village, sold my loot for 250 dinars, considered purchasing a steed but then decided to head over to Glintor, cause their brand of mounts are more affordable. And you know what? Because these ranchers allowed me to buy their animals, I will try really hard to avoid killing them or raiding their homes. Same with a village of Orthra where I bought my freedom in the form of my first horse, which allowed me to outrun those who wanted to see me locked up. But now that we were ready, it was time to venture into Vlandia and look for more money-making opportunities. Getting there was not a walk in the park though, because a Batanian noblewoman was patrolling the area and she took an interest in me and my band of beggars. Because my party moves faster, we could easily escape, but I 
kinda made the mistake of getting a bit too close to the nearest castle, without realizing that another lord was hiding inside and as soon as he saw me, his army burst through the gates and gave chase. Don't worry, I escaped, but this encounter made me realize that I should keep my distance from enemy fortifications, or at least make sure that no lordly banners are present within their walls. If I strayed just a little closer, I'd have lost everything. Anyway, as we went towards Vlandia, I noticed my first opportunity. A group of 19 peasants who were returning to their village after a successful trade trip into the nearest town. Which means, they must have money! Ideally, I'd be able to rob them of everything they have, but with such a small and unintimidating gang, I doubt I can pull that off. So my plan was to slowly squeeze as much as I can out of them by launching multiple attacks upon them. In the first assault I was going to kill as many as I needed to in order to get the others to run away, then I would use the runners as punching bags to develop my athletic skill, while still allowing a few of them to escape unscathed. You already know how this goes, but a straightforward attack wasn't going to work because they outnumber us, and their farming tools are surprisingly effective weapons, especially against my rabble. If I wanted to win, I had to use every little advantage I had to its fullest potential. Advantage number one, they are not attacking. They've taken a defensive position which would make an infantry charge a death sentence for my men. But this is where advantage number two comes in. I have an archer, so I can order him to get close to the enemy and fire upon them at his own discretion. In the meantime, my infantry had assumed a defensive stance and when these guys feel the pressure, they'll have no option but to come to us, at which point I can take the archer behind my frontline warriors as they are ordered to push onwards. One by one, the peasants fell to my archer's arrows and when four of them perished, most of the survivors decided to flee while the remaining few started running towards us. It was time to give the archer the order to advance, which actually makes him maintain maximum distance from the enemy while still shooting at them. At the same time, the infantry initiated its charge while I ran after the runners in order to harvest some athletics XP out of them. Six villagers earned me two levels in that skill. So if I wanted to be actually competent in combat, I'd need to make a mountain of corpses. What can I say? Fitness programs were a bit different in the Middle Ages. But when we looted these villagers, I only got 32 gold. Well, that's disappointing. This means they have a total of 320 coins and right now I feel compelled to explain how I've reached that conclusion to prevent any more telepathic questioning. Here's how it works. When you attack bandits, you take half of their money and half of the cargo they're transporting. If you attack peasants or caravans, however, you may get half of their cargo, but you can only claim a tenth of the gold they're carrying. The other 90% is taken away by the survivors. These guys have 320 dinars, I got 10% of that. Next time I attack them, I'll get about 29 gold, which is a tenth of what they have left after my initial attack. At least their loot brought me some consolation. Their dirty rags, farming tools and sumter horses are bound to fetch a decent price. But I wanted more, so I attacked them again. This time I did not have the patience to watch my archer harass them with arrows. So I ordered everyone to charge as I stampeded towards them. I tried to eliminate a few enemies with my javelins, but I couldn't even score a single kill. I did heavily injure some of them, and I was hoping my soldiers would finish them off. And eventually they did, but at great cost. My recklessness got three of my looters killed, with Luther among them. Rest in peace, brother. Wait, do you get to rest in peace if you're invited to feast for all eternity into the drowned god's watery halls? Uh, maybe not, but at the very least, your meals and drinks are served to you by beautiful mermaids. I am sad to see my first companion gone, but that's the price you must pay for leading a life of crime. Word to the wise, if your way of life involves stealing, robbing and killing, don't be surprised when it suddenly comes to a violent end. 
Also, don't get too attached to those who live this life with you, because they will pay the debt they have accrued for the crimes they have committed against their fellow man. But life must go on, and the raiding must continue. Before we conclude our business with this party of peasants, let's see what we got. Another workhorse, three prisoners, and the 29 gold I expected. Then I approached the last survivor and gave him a choice between his money or his life. He refused to give me the money, so I sent my men to kill him and they brought me 26 coins and another Sumter horse. The bodies of those we've murdered were still warm when the three peasants we've captured came to me and offered to join my gang. Said that they've always despised being bound in servitude to the nobility, performing back-breaking labor and getting nothing in return. They've also said that in just the last month, their village got raided twice and the only time their lord checked on them was by sending his tax collector. They'd much rather live free and take what they want from others, instead of going back to the life of serfdom they've just been violently liberated from. That sounded good to me. I lost three looters and gained three peasants, who aren't any more competent at the moment but at least have the potential to become actual soldiers. After this was over, my journey into Vlandia continued until I ran into a group of 13 sea raiders. But even though I had the numeric advantage, I wasn't sure I could win in a straight fight. So instead I herded them towards the nearest village, where I was planning to catch them in an ambush, where we could use the houses as cover against their relentless barrage of javelins, therefore minimizing our casualties. But when I finally caught them, another gang of three bandits wandered a bit too close and the odds were no longer in my favor. Because I didn't want to waste additional time luring those seafarers into another settlement, I decided to attack the mountaineers instead. Before I did, I equipped my bludgeon, hoping to knock them out, capture them and eventually invite them in my crew. The fight was rather boring to be honest, so I won't talk about it. Unfortunately, one of my Vlandian recruits perished after catching a highwayman's javelin with his face. The only thing of value I took from these bandits was a woodland cloak, which offered slightly more protection than my scarf in addition to being a bit more visually pleasing. But the show must go on and more people must die, such as these 15 looters, 13 of which were slain by me personally. This training session took me to level 54 in athletics, and once I passed the threshold, I unlocked a perk that would make my armor feel less burdensome, which in turn improves my running speed. In the same vein, I unlocked a one-handed perk that reduces the weight of my shield, which would have a positive impact on my mobility, albeit very slightly. But after this moment of self-reflection, it was time to double tap the last of the looters who bargained for his life. If his loot was any better, I'd have had him killed, but as things stand, he'll provide more value as a soldier in my shield wall. Afterwards, I gave chase to a gang of 19 looters, but this time, things did not go well. Don't worry, the battle was won, but during the fighting, I suffered a mineral overdose, whose side effects include, but are not limited to, severe joint pain, headaches, as well as loss of consciousness. My men carried that fight and oh my god is that Luther I see? Damn, I thought he was dead. I even held a tearful eulogy in honor of his sacrifice. Still, good to see he is still alive and kicking. Perhaps the guy who died back then was simply someone who looked like Luther. Well, this guy chased down the last of the villagers as he tried making his retreat. Still, my point stands, it's best not to get attached to anyone. So when Luther inevitably bites the dust, I won't bother giving him another eulogy since I've already done it. As for the loot we got in this fight, it was pretty good. 200 gold, which means we'll get another 100 once I have my men kill those who've escaped. But now that I was injured, I could no longer stay in Vlandia, simply because I wasn't able to fight anymore, so I was going to return to Batania to purchase more mounts. On our way there, however, I noticed a group of 15 workers from the silver mines of Dreamor. I assumed that these fellas just sold their ore into the nearest city, which means they must have money, so I decided to hold this position for a while until I heal up. 
at the same time blocking their only way back home. When I finally had enough health to attack, I was expecting a big payday, but the only thing I got from this fight was a concussion. Before we even engaged in combat, I told my men to immediately cease the hostilities if I were to fall, so in the end, the villagers were let go and I was patched up by my loyal soldiers, having settled on my initial goal of going to Glintor. But despite my desire to stick to the plan and avoid being a leaf in the wind, I encountered a rather interesting situation. A group of 23 peasants just got ambushed by a gang of 11 sea raiders. I wanted to see how it would play out and then sick my hounds on whoever emerged victorious. But while observing the attack from a safe distance, another 7 bandits joined in and sealed the villagers' fate. The problem is, now there's 15 outlaws and I only have 14 battle-ready troops, who have no hope of succeeding without my intervention, so I had to wait for the two gangs to split up and pick between one of them. The remaining five mountain bandits were obviously the better choice, but chasing them was not easy. They kept running, at some point they were about to merge with the sea raiders, and they were even unwittingly assisted by a Vlandian lord. Eventually I caught them in a forest and by the time I did, I restored enough health to be able to join in the attack. As far as fights go, this one was pretty standard. A couple of my men succumbed to their javelin allergies, one of the high waymen lived up to his name as he got even higher, and two brigands got their teeth knocked out and were promptly captured. Because of all the fighting we've done over the past year, my clan was slowly building a reputation and has just reached tier 1 which allows me to lead more warriors into battle, assuming I can find enough people to fill my ranks. If I do, a gang of 47 brigands will be good enough to start attacking settlements and maybe even raid caravans. But that is very, very far in the future. For now, let us take a look at what this fight earned us. 151 gold, some shitty bandit gear, as well as a sumter horse and a bit of clay, which were undoubtedly stolen from the peasants they've just raided. Speaking of peasants, six of them were taken captive by this gang and when I rescued them, they preferred to join my gang instead of going back to their meager lives as manual laborers. With some fresh meat in my warband, we were now 22 raiders strong, which means we're going to need more horses in order to maintain our mobility. So we kept going towards Glintor, which is something I've been attempting to do for several days now. As we kept going, we noticed another group of bandits assaulting some villagers and I was planning to profit from this opportunity. When the criminals inevitably prevailed, I introduced myself and then politely suggested them to surrender to me. They adamantly refused, so I had no choice but to teach them a lesson in violence. But before I began the attack, I realized that these bandits were stronger than my gang. Luckily, one of the highwaymen I captured some time ago decided to join us and with him on board, the balance of power tilted slightly in our favor. Now, mountain bandits are not a trifle to deal with, especially when your fighting force consists mostly of looters and peasants, because these brigands wield devastating javelins that can kill in one hit, as I painfully found out on my own skin. Unfortunately, I was completely useless in that fight, so it was up to my men to finish the job, if they could. But the enemies outskilled and outgunned my fighters, and when several of mine were killed, the rest ran away to save themselves. Or so the anti-Ironborn propaganda would have you believe. In actuality, my men relied upon the battle doctrine I taught them. If I'm down and you can't quite finish a fight, feign a retreat, regroup and strike back with full force. That's exactly what they've done and the battle was won. Without this trick, we would have surely lost that fight and I'd have been forced to waste a lot more time rebuilding my gang from the ground up. Still, this was a hard-fought victory which claimed the lives of six of my people. But the nine peasants we've liberated were grateful for the rescue and pledged their swords to me. Figuratively speaking, they don't have any swords, just a few rusty farm tools, but you get the point. I also captured eight bandits who will hopefully join me at some point, but most importantly, this fight earned us 400 gold and a lot of decent gear which would sell for a good chunk of money. I also found a kite shield that would probably offer better protection than the one I currently have. 
Before we moved towards our destination, one of the Vlandians I rescued earlier informed me that he found a crossbow among the loot and that he would like to use it, so I gave him the green light and effectively doubled the amount of archers in my party. But how did those bandits get a crossbow? I asked my sharpshooter and he reminded me that they've just raided a bunch of Vlandian villagers who might have been escorted by a couple of crossbowmen. He also said that these weapons are quite common in Vlandian settlements but are practically unused by any of the other factions, which gave me an idea. What if I used one of these myself? Don't get me wrong, I prefer the violent rush of melee combat, but there's only so many enemies I can slay before they close in and overwhelm me, whereas a crossbow is basically a weapon of mass destruction, as long as it's used correctly. It'll be a while until I get one of those, so let's make do with what we have for the moment, namely the javelins, the spear, and the axe that I took from one of the mountain bandits I killed. Until this very moment, a lot of events have transpired, so a long time must have passed since this chapter began, right? Not right. It's actually been less than a fortnight since we got started in the fifth day of winter and boy oh boy, there's so much more to be done. Perhaps I'll finally arrive to Glintor? I've been trying to do that for quite a while and I've already been in three other fights since I made that decision. Before I get there, it would be a good idea to stop in the nearby village to sell some of the clay, mules and armor I stole from my recent raids, which would probably add up to nearly a thousand dinars. After narrowly avoiding a couple of Vlandian patrols, I finally arrived to my destination, where they were selling a warhorse for the same amount of dinars that I had in the beginning of this episode. I technically have enough money to purchase this one, but quite frankly, I'd rather not blow my entire budget on a warhorse right now, so I sold my loot and purchased three more mounts for my soldiers to ride on. That wasn't enough, so I also went to the other horse ranch to buy four more of those and with renewed speed, we gave chase to a band of 22 looters who sadly only carried a little over 300 gold. As you know, I got half that amount in my first attack, but I let one of them live so I can perform the double tap and when I caught up, I told him to surrender or die. He did offer to join me, but I'd rather have taken the gold, and because he valued his life, he surrendered, and that's how I got the other half. I didn't actually bother taking him prisoner, I just let him go after he emptied his pockets. Don't feel bad for him though, because right now, he has a weapon and some clothes, which is more than I had when my journey began, and look where I am today. Shortly after that, I met a group of Batanian peasants and out of curiosity I inquired about their cargo. They were carrying 33 units of hardwood and some foodstuffs which they were willing to part with for the low, low price of 180 coins. Thanks to my elite negotiation skills, I reduced that price to zero after I double tapped this party and got 25 units of wood, as well as a couple of workhorses that I was planning to sell because quite frankly, too many pack animals can actually slow us down and we're bound to get more of them if we keep raiding civilians like this. But I'm assuming you'd also like to know how the fight went? Well, it wasn't that interesting. The peasants held their position, which is common practice, and I wasn't going to send my infantry to attack them when I have archers to do the killing from afar. After enough targets were shot down, the survivors tried to escape, but only one managed to do so, because I allowed it. If I was able to commit a robbery, I would have gotten all 33 units of wood, but the last survivor refused to surrender, so I had him killed and only got 25 which equates to roughly 75% of his inventory. Got 50% in the first attack, and another 25% in the second. That's why I always aim to double tap instead of finishing my enemy in one swift strike. Once that was taken care of, it was time to go towards Vlandia and try to get my hands on a proper weapon. Only way to do that, however, is by finding a village that's recently been raided and doesn't have a whole lot of militia protecting it. The first of these villages was Druimor, which only had five fighters. But in order to attack them, I needed a pretense. Raiding, conscription or extortion. I could have used additional warriors in my crew, so I chose the second option and because the defense was pathetic, I didn't even bother joining my men in the assault. 
The gear we looted, however, was not of Vlandian craftsmanship, so there was no chance I could have gotten the ranged weapon I needed. I was confused at first, but one of my men clarified that even though this village is under Vlandian occupation, its inhabitants are of Batanian origin, so I decided to keep attacking settlements until I get what I want. As for the conscripts, I added three more archers, two recruits and one veteran skirmisher to my ranks. They were a bit hesitant to join my gang, but some of the peasants I rescued earlier vouched for me said that in addition to granting them freedom, I'm a good boss who shares the loot fairly and looks after his men. Well, I'm glad they think so, but the only reason I look after them is because I need someone to enforce my will. I can't do everything all by myself. Maybe I will be able to, once I obtain some proper armaments. Anyway, it was time to go deeper into Vlandian territory, but just as we were crossing the mountains, I encountered a group of looters and sent my men to kill them all. Apparently, these boys got lucky in one of their raids because they had a lot of gold on them, as well as 10 villager prisoners, which I rescued and invited into my crew. This was a huge power spike for me because in the span of just a couple of days, the size of my gang almost doubled, and I was going to use my swollen numbers to further scale my operations. So I postponed my return into Vlandia and turned back towards the village of Kaleus, which was only defended by four people. However, when I forced the locals to give me some of their fighting men, they immediately complied and those four didn't even put up a fight. A wise choice, which unfortunately deprived me of the opportunity to obtain a crossbow. Still, I rounded up a total of nine soldiers from this village, six cavalry units and three recruits, all of whom were taken under my wing. But because my party was already full, Three of the villagers I rescued earlier were allowed to return to their former lives where they'd tend to their fields until a raiding party such as mine comes along to put that to a fiery but peaceful end. And with that, I now have a proper gang of 48 people with whom I can achieve great things. I didn't make a whole lot of progress in terms of currency, I barely have 400 denars more than what I began the episode with, but it is enough to pay the wages of my crew for 10 more days which is alright for the time being, so let's not waste any more time and make more money. The plan was the same as before, go to Vlandia, look for opportunities and maybe attack some poorly defended villages. But as I was chasing my next score, I came to the realization that because my gang is so large, our speed slightly decreased. We no longer have enough horses for everyone, but that speed penalty was offset by the contingent of cavalry I've recently conscripted and to further remedy the situation, I set six of my prisoners free, after which I briefly reflected upon my recent days. So much fighting, so much blood, so much death. Seeing that many people cut open taught me a thing or two about how the human body operates. And with my newfound medical expertise, I discovered a trick that would allow me to quickly patch myself up after each fight. Prior to unlocking this ability, if I were to fall in battle, I'd be unable to fight for a few days which is detrimental to my raiding attempts because if I want to squeeze a group of villagers, I have to attack them more than once. But now, it doesn't matter how many times I fall because as long as I live, I'll always get back up and be ready to fight in the next round. What is dead may never die, but rises again, harder and stronger. With renewed strength, it was time to continue on my path of destruction to the detriment of these peasants from Tormelina. When I said, hello, how are you fine gentlemen doing today? They responded that they're returning home after a successful trade trip into the nearest market. This lets me know that they're carrying money, not wares, so my intention was to commit a robbery instead of trying to squeeze them for more loot. Just like other farmers we've raided, these guys assumed a defensive position and were waiting for us to make the first move, so I told everyone to get closer to them. Once my archers were in position, they started firing upon our defenseless opponents until they were given no choice but to come to us. When they closed in, they started flinging rocks at my frontline warriors and I instinctively positioned my horse to protect Luther from their wrath even though this wasn't a life-threatening situation for him, or any one of us really. But when the rock throwing ceased and the peasants drew their sides, I had to order the infantry to charge because otherwise they would have just stood there getting hit until they died. 
In the blink of an eye, a couple of enemies have fallen and the survivors fled for their lives, but you already know I can't let that happen. So I rode after them and threw a javelin at the first fleeing Batanian peasant I could see, but when I killed him, I uh, realized he was one of my Batanian peasants. And he wasn't fleeing, but chasing the runners. Well, can't do much except give him a heartfelt my bad. But then again, if he didn't want to die, he shouldn't have looked like the enemy and mimicking their behavior. As for the rest of the fleeing peasants, I took this opportunity to train my athletics a little more and when the battle was done, four of them made their escape and I got 51 gold. So they were carrying a total of 510 and if I wanted to get all of it, I needed to convince them to give me everything, otherwise this fight would have been even less profitable than attacking looters. When I caught up with the four who have escaped, I told him I'll let them live if they empty their pockets, but they defiantly refused my generous offer, so I put three more of them into the ground and told the last survivor to relent. But he chose death before dishonor. I fulfilled his final wish, and as payment for my trouble, I earned a total of 138 coins and four workhorses, which are probably worth another 200. A pathetic contribution. I needed more, so I was going to attack these 12 pirates and take everything they have. Now, 48 versus 12 is a guaranteed victory, but even so, most of my guys are unarmored peasants who will die after catching just one javelin, so my job was to ride around the raiders and make them waste their projectiles on me. I was successful in my mission, but so was the enemy when they crippled my horse and knocked me out. That's the price I was willing to pay in order to minimize the casualties on my side and my sacrifice was worth it, because not a single one of my soldiers lost his life in the attack, which rewarded me with 240 gold coins and a decent amount of gear. But of course I wasn't going to be satisfied with just that, so I double tapped the fuckers and got the rest of their gold and another bag of javelins. I briefly considered replacing my spear with those javelins in order to have more ammo, but I quickly changed my mind. When the looting concluded, I crossed paths with two gangs of mountain bandits and decided to fight them, but due to some tactical mishaps on my part, five of my boys paid for this victory with their lives and the reward wasn't even worth it. When I caught the last survivor, he offered to join the crew, but I refused and he surrendered his money and freedom to me. After dealing with another gang of raiders, I noticed something that looked like a big payday. A group of 20 villagers. When I said hello to them, I could see that they were transporting a shipment of fur towards the nearest town, which is actually a lot better than money. As you've seen a bit earlier, if my victims carry hard cash, the juice is often not worth the squeeze, which isn't something that can be said about trade goods because if I attack the same group three times, I get almost 90% of their cargo and then I can probably sell the spoils into another village that's willing to pay a decent price for them. You already know how this goes. Get my army close, harass the enemy with arrows, and when they initiate their charge, so do we. That's it. I didn't need to do anything special to win this fight. Just a bit of cardio training to make the most of it. At the end of this slaughter, 9 survived, 11 died, and it was time for round 2. Chasing the survivors took a bit of time, but when we caught them, I dealt with them on my own, while my men were left to their own devices, twiddling their thumbs or picking their noses. To be honest, I was a bit clumsy in my approach, I missed a few of my shots and not a single one of my spear thrusts was an instant kill. What I'm trying to say is that just like this sentence, the fight was drawn out way more than it should have been, but after two of the villagers were slain, their morale broke and the other seven tried to flee, which allowed me to continue my cardio training. When it was all done, only a couple of the villagers survived. A mistake on my part, I didn't intend for more than one to go, cause the more people escape, the less likely it is for them to give in to my perfectly reasonable demands. But they did, and they surrendered everything they were carrying to me. 17 units of fur, a bit of food, and 9 workhorses. This wasn't a big payday, but it was the first time we've actually taken everything from an opposing group. And this accomplishment marks the beginning of a long and fruitful career of armed robbery. Let's hope there's many more of these in the future. 
And now that we've reached this important milestone, I believe it would be a good time to make the cut in today's episode, but before we do, let us take a brief look at everything we've achieved since this chapter began precisely a month ago. In terms of money, I can't say I made a whole lot of progress. I've barely added 211 dinars on top of what I already had in my savings account at the beginning of this episode, but I did invest a lot of coin into additional amounts and I also had to pay the wages of my crew, which has added up to a daily cost of 155 dinars. Speaking of the crew, it now consists of 41 hardened criminals who are quite capable of relieving people of their earthly possessions, especially now that we've committed our first robbery. With this, we might be able to hunt larger prey, but I'll try to be careful not to bite more than I can chew. So even though I may be able to do all this, it's a better idea to hit smaller targets until our financial situation improves. Which might happen sooner rather than later, seeing how I have plenty of loot that I haven't yet sold. I got 16 Sumter horses, a bunch of wood and fur, as well as a lot of second-hand tools and clothing that we've taken from those we've killed. I've also changed my dull sword with a slightly sharper axe, and my round buckler was replaced by a kite shield that might do a better job at protecting me. But yeah, that was all for today. Thanks for tuning in and I hope to see you again in the next episode, where we'll pick up from where we left off. Goodbye for now.